नमस्कार दिस गुरु पूर्णिमा माई बेस्ट विशेष एंड ब्लैसिंग टू ऑल फ्यू द सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ दिस डे इन टर्म्स ऑफ exploring human possibilities is unparalleled because it's on this day a little over 15000 years ago that adi yogi for the first time chose to turn himself into a means of transmission transmitting a dimension which was unheard of till then predating all religion predating all ideologies for the first time he brought this possibility into human life that if you are willing to strive if you are willing to strive you can cross all the limitations that have been set upon you by your own means or by nature you can transcend all this if you are willing to strive he not only said this he not only opened up this possibility he expanded the entire science and technologies and various methods and practices through which an individual human being can rise beyond all limitations the idea of transcendence only happened on this day the idea of transcendence was first brought into to the human race only on this day so this day has always been celebrated as one of the most significant days for those who are aspiring to be something more than who they are right now tell me one person who is not aspiring to be something more than what he or she is right now it is just that each person is aspiring to be something more within the limitations of what they know one person's idea of something more may be money another person's idea of something more may be wealth another person's idea of something more may be knowledge love pleasure but there is no human being who is not aspiring to be something more than what they are right now the aspiration is universal the currency employed for this aspiration may be of various kinds now the question is how many who aspire for this something more realize that more is not going to fulfill this being if you get that something more that you're aspiring for today tomorrow you will aspire for something more if that happens something more because this is not aspiring for more this is aspiring for all so he brought this awareness to start with with the seven sages who gathered around him today they are celebrated in this country as saptarishis and they in turn brought it to humanity in so many different ways the significance of the day is that that it is a shift it is the first full moon day after the shifting of the solstice this time certain calendar adjustments has moved it to the second but normally it is the first full moon day 
It is also a time when the sun begins to move southward in relation with this planet on which we are. So, it is also a time which is a time which is best for receiving grace for a variety of reasons. So, this day was one day which was universally celebrated in this part of the world at one time. This system of celebrating Guru Purnima and becoming available to grace got dislocated only after the British took over and made sure that you have to go to office on that day. So, this grand celebration that used to happen across the country and in this entire region, not just in India, kind of got little dislocated because it is a day when you have to go to work. So, things got disturbed, but still, in this country at least, still millions and millions of people are conscious that this is a day of grace, this is a day they can e easily become available to grace and hence it's lived on. A time has come in the history of humanity where our ability to do things in the outside world has almost become superhuman. When I say superhuman, I want you to understand a thousand years ago or even a hundred years ago, what an individual human being could do and what an individual human being can do today, simply because of the aid of science and technology, is literally hu superhuman. I'm sure a hundred years ago, if you pulled out something from your pocket and spoke to somebody in America right now, people would definitely think you're superhuman or more. Believe me, if you had a cell phone hundred years ago, you could have claimed you're God and they would have believed it. You just got your phones too late <laughs> So, what powered like this on various levels, it's extremely important that raising of human consciousness becomes of paramount importance and raising consciousness essentially means this, that you're longing to expand, wanting to be something more. You find a vehicle through which you can expand limitlessly. So Adiyogi on this day transmitted 112 ways in which one can expand limitlessly, hundred and twelve ways, enough variety for you. If you don't like one, you can pick the other. One hundred and twelve ways in which you can attain to a limitless expansion. So, here we are on this day and I'm supposed to hang out. When we generally say hang out, we mean just, it's a gossipy session, so no problem. Because when it comes to inner dimensions, you can only gossip. Because you cannot talk about it, you can only talk around it. So, we can only gossip, so it's appropriate, we're just hanging out with you, please <laughs> The very first question in our Google Hangout session is from an online, online participant called Cyrus 
from Maryland, USA. And Cyrus's question, Sadhguru, is that many people firmly believe that people do not require a guru to become enlightened. Rather, they believe that the power to become enlightened lies within us and is within our control. Is it realistic to think that we can achieve an enlightenment without a guru? In Maryland? <clears throat> now, uh, if we have to learn something as simple as ABC, alphabets, twenty-six only in English language. Sanskrit has fifty-four, Tamil has two hundred odd. Twenty-six only, twenty-six alphabets. How many of you believe that if you did not have a teacher, you would have learned these twenty-six alphabets? That's the answer <laughs> And especially if you want to walk an uncharted path, new terrain, if you go into new terrain, it is sensible to take instructions, believe me. Otherwise, You could try an adventure, but even those who adventure, these days use a GPS. Earlier they use maps or, li or they listen to the locals. Those who do not want to listen to another human being who has already walked the terrain, and think they can do it by themselves. Nothing wrong, I'm not saying they cannot, they can, why not? After all, you're only trying to walk the inner territory. It's just that what you could do in a short span of time, you may do it in a million years. If I ask you, if almost all of you are wearing a watch, This is not some rocket science, just a watch. They've been ticking around for hundreds of years now. I will give you all the parts of this watch, dismantle and give it to you. Put it together, let me see. No, no, I'm not asking you to manufacture a watch. It's all there, we'll dismantle it and give it to you. Put it together, let me see. We'll give you a manual how to do it. Please do it and see, let me see. You will have a watch, but it won't tick. <laughs> Similarly, on the spiritual path, without guidance you want to go, all the best. No problem, it's just that unnecessary Unnecessary hardship you'll create for yourself. If you like it the hard way, fine, what's the problem? Some people like suffering, they think nothing good can come out of life unless you suffer. If you're, if you're that kind, it's all right. But my intention, my intention is, People should walk this path blissfully, joyfully, ecstatic if it's possible. If you want to go on a tour joyfully, better to go on a guided tour, believe me. <laughs> Please. Our next question is from the international cricketing legend and well-loved Indian batsman, Virender Sehwag. Yeah. 
Now he speaks with his back. This is a technology issue, it's not him, okay? I'm afraid I will have to read the question while we sort out the audio issue. The question is, why don't people just share their knowledge, Sadhguru? Why do they withhold it? Why don't they share it the way you do? Oh. Uh, this is the age of intellectual property. <laughs> Somebody even wants to patent yoga sinas. You can patent the asana, but still you can't get into it. You may have patented all the difficult asanas, but can you get into it? That's a question. So, uh, we have come to a place in the world where everything is monetized, everything has a commercial angle to it. So because of that, as people have been miserly with money, now they are miserly with knowledge because, you know, knowledge is money. So they are miserly with that because it's money in some way. So this monetizing of everything can really destroy many things in this world. In this culture, we always fixed it like this. Spiritual process, health related things and education. These three things should never be commercialized. Everything else can be commercialized. These three things should always be offered. The question is only about the qualification of the recipient. All kinds of people come and say, I want to go, I want to do this, I want to do that. Two days later they won't be here. So the question is only about the qualifications of the recipient. If that one thing is ensured, knowledge should be offered irrespective of commercial interests that are involved in it. But today everything is commercialized. And in many ways, you can't help it because the whole momentum is in that direction. We render may be willing to share his knowledge. He may teach ten different people how to hold the bat, how to hit the ball, how to stand, how to do this, how to do that. But how many will go about scoring double centuries after double centuries? <laughs> It's not easy. Knowledge may be there. When it comes to experiential knowing, how many people are willing to receive it? Everybody says, yes, I every day meet people. All the way, Sadhguru, I want to go all the way. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, they are crying because somebody said something, they want to leave. Day after tomorrow morning, their uncle's daughter's birthday, they want to go. 
I am not saying there is anything wrong, wrong with your uncle's daughter. <laughs> All I am saying is, your interests are many. That means you are not going anywhere. You can have, dabble with many, but there must be one direction to life, otherwise you are not going far. You are going to wander around here. If you want to go penetrate through something and go a distance, you need some one-pointedness. People come here, they say, Sadhguru, you give me any kind of sadhana, I'm willing to die, Sadhguru. <laughs> said, don't die, hold it <laughs> I am willing to offer anything, but hold it, we'll see, we'll go step by step. Three days later they come and say, Sadhguru, you know, Sadhguru, I, I have found somebody, Sadhguru, I think uh, for lifetimes this person must have been waiting for me. I saw this girl and <laughs> Now, now there is a spiritual angle <laughs> If you have known somebody for lifetimes and they didn't make it, it's best you keep away from them. <laughs> because for most people, their direction of life keeps changing every other day. It's hard to offer anything, it's all bits and pieces. Of course, there are also people who think, See, knowledge is not something that you own because knowledge is not about you. Knowledge is about the creation, about the nature of the creation. What is already there is what you have absorbed. You didn't invent it, you didn't come up with it, you only saw it. This is why the language in this country is very clear. When it comes to any kind of spiritual dimension, we are only talking about realization. Realizing means something that was always there, always right here, but you were so stupid you didn't see it, today you saw it. I had realized, I did not attain, I did not arise, I did not climb somewhere, I just realized. But the thing was always here. So, what is here all the time as truth cannot belong to somebody. Nobody can stop you from it, but those who have accessed, if they are truly accessed, they will never block you, they will never hold back. Only those who have accumulated from books and stuff, they will hold back because any accumulated stuff is limited and it'll get over. If you give away everything, it'll get over tomorrow morning, you won't know what to do. So you will hold it and be miserly because you have gathered it. What is gathered, you can hold back. What you have realized, you can hold back because it's an endless run. You're only constantly wishing there is somebody here who can soak it up as fast as you can give it. That is the problem. The problem is of lack of receptivity, not of holding back, if you really know. But if you have acquired knowledge, you will be miserly because you can only acquire that much. You don't want, to, don't want it to get over. Knowledge is like money again. <laughs> it can get over. Our next question comes from Brim, who's a circus performer and teacher based in France. Namaskar, I'm Sadhguru. Um, as people living in Western societies uh, with many distractions at every corner, um, what focus should we hold in our daily lives to best receive what you have to offer? 
I'm afraid I will have to read this question as well, while the technical difficulties are being sorted out. Vin's question is, people living in Western societies have many distractions at every corner. How do we maintain a focus in our daily lives to best receive what you have to offer? Uh, the distraction is not only in the West. <laughs> For those who want to be distracted, there is distractions everywhere, not only today. And not just today, even a thousand years ago, people were still distracted, believe me. Don't think thousand years ago everybody was focused and fantastic, no. They were just as good as you or as bad as you. <laughs> they were also hanging out in small groups. Now we hang out globally. <laughs> so, <clears throat> what is that one thing I have to do? To be focused or to be able to receive what is offered. It's very simple. Just remind yourself. Tomorrow morning, when you wake up in the morning, just check, still alive. Because every day over a million people die on this planet. You woke up tomorrow morning. Over a million people did not wake up tomorrow morning, will not wake up tomorrow morning, believe me. You woke up, just check, you are still there. Great, isn't it? You're still alive. Can you at least smile? Oh, I'm still alive. Great. Just check those three, four, five people who really matter in your life. Check if all of them are alive. Because if one million people die, at least ten million people lost somebody who's dear to them, isn't it? So all those who, are, who really matter for you, you're alive, they're alive. Fantastic today. It's a great day, isn't it? Don't take this lightly, it's not a joke. Because I'm not minding you of this, because most of you think other people die. No, not me. It's only others who die. No, no, you and me will die. Sadhguru, I'm asking a spiritual question, you're reminding me of morbid things. No, nothing morbid about it. Death is the one common denominator among all of us, isn't it? Yes? One thing common about us, whether you're black, white, blue, yellow, whatever kind you are, man, woman or other six genders, Whatever you may be, one common denominator among all of us is, we will die one day. Look at the universality of death. Only when you remind yourself that you are mortal, wanting to know something beyond the physicality of who you are becomes an active process you will become receptive only when you know the body that you carry, the psychological drama that you are going through, all this is going on but one day it will end. Very easily it will end, believe me. You just have to wait. <laughs> See, you don't have to do anything to achieve death, just have to wait. Both for yours and others. People come and say, Sadhguru, this guy, my enemy, I can't bear it. I said, just wait. <laughs> you don't have to take the trouble, just wait. One way or the other you will get rid of him, either he will die or you will die.
So do this every hour. Right now, 7.30. Oh, I'm still alive. Great. Maybe from 6.30 to 7.30, you know how many people died on the planet? But it's not me right now. Now, if you are continuously conscious of your mortal nature, you will become one hundred percent alive to the spiritual dimension of who you are. Only because somewhere, it's not that intellectually you do not know, but experientially you are immortal, you know? Because when I look at the number of shoes you have bought, It looks like you're going to live for ten thousand years. <laughs> Number of clothes and shoes, when I look at them, it looks like a lot of people are planning for thousand, ten thousand years of life. No, 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 it's a brief life. If you know it's a brief life and you're definitely mortal, we will try to stretch it with yoga. Hmm? We'll try to stretch it and make it a little longer, but <laughs> Anyway you will die, if you are conscious of this every moment of your life, initially because you're in Europe, because particularly you're in Europe and you've always believed you're immortal, it may be a little struggle in, in the beginning, let's just remind yourself every minute that I'm mortal, I'll die someday and maybe it's today. Come to ease with death then the longing to know what is beyond this physical nature will burst forth within you. Once this longing comes, you are one hundred percent receptive to everything that I represent. The next question comes from Divya Bharati Ramaswamy, who's doing an MA in Computer Science in Zurich, Switzerland. Is he talking kind or no? <laughs> Namaskaram, Namaskaram. My question is: Would marriage be only a human? Spiritually speaking, especially women. And also, as someone who has gone through it yourself, what would you say from your experience? Something about would marriage be a hindrance? Something, okay. Is marriage a hindrance? for one spiritual journey. See, marriage is not a commodity that you carry on your head, but many people carry it on their head. It's just an arrangement so that socially there is some sense to the way you fulfill the needs that you have. A human being has needs, physical, psychological, emotional, financial, social, various kinds of needs. To fulfill these things in a dignified manner, we came up with something called marriage, so that it is fulfilled within a framework your desires don't run wild and disturb everything in the society, some kind of a framework so that it can be con conducted in a sensible manner. Now you have raised this to heaven because somebody told you marriages are made in heaven. Only the unmarried ones think so. So it's just two people, all right? 
Now, spiritual process is about turning inward. Can I turn inward with somebody else? <laughs> Marriage is an arrangement to fulfill certain aspect of your life. Don't complicate life by thinking, we will walk together on the spiritual path, there's no such thing. Because spiritual path is not <laughs> not the path that you take into the Velangiri mountains, that you want to walk together. Even if you go to Velangiri mountains, please don't walk hand in hand. It's a narrow pathway and it's not an appropriate way to walk in the forest. You can walk in the park walk hand in hand. You can go shopping hand in hand. You can sit in a cinema hand in hand. You can't turn inward hand in hand. Now, does it mean to say someone who's married, what it means, let's understand this. Someone who is married means someone who's made an official arrangement for their needs in life. A formal arrangement for simple needs that a human being has, which are biological, which are psychological, which are social, many things. So these arrangements that you have made, Conduct these arrangements gracefully, so there will be time and space for you to turn around. If you pay excess attention to these arrangements, then turning around will not be possible. This does not mean if you're alone you will do it. If you're alone you may be always looking out. You spend your entire time and life looking out for somebody. That will also not help. If you think your desires, your longings and your needs can be well handled by an arrangement of marriage, all right? Don't try to raise it to heaven. It doesn't happen in heaven, believe me. And if heaven is making so many mistakes, <laughs> then we'll have to seriously reconsider many things. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, uh, in India, we don't blame it on the heaven. We do our own calculations of all the arrangements of stars and planets and everything. We match all the planets and stars very well. It's very easy to ma match stars because they never fought ever. But to match these two people, that nobody has managed except those two people if they are sensible. If they are sensible, they can manage it. Nobody else can match these two people. Priests have tried, gods have tried, ghosts and goblins have tried, it's not worked and not worked and not worked. Two sensible people, they can manage. If both of them understand the limitations of the arrangement and the possibilities of the arrangement, they can conduct it sensibly. If you try to raise it to heaven, you will see it will for sure crash. So your marriage has nothing to do with your spiritual process because your spiritual process is an inward journey. But one dimension of this is, to walk alone people falter. Actually this question was asked to Gautama, the Buddha, is it better to walk alone or in company? Gautama looked and said, it's better to walk alone than to walk with a fool. Because Gautama, not me, okay? <laughs> Gautama believes only a fool will marry you. It's him, not me, okay? <laughs> This is a question that comes from Stephanie in Malaysia.
Namaskaram Sadhguru. Namaskaram to the first one who is speaking clearly. <laughs> Having been to various international forums and met many where do you see the world for the better or worst? Oh, let me correct that question a bit. Uh, yes, I've been in international forums, met many leaders, you added great leaders. So, many leaders, not always so great. Yes, there are a few great leaders, no question about that. Where is the world heading? <laughs> there are many possibilities because we have capabilities and technologies which no other generation could ever dream of. Will our capabilities turn against us or will they work for us is the big question. If all the human capabilities which are so hugely enhanced because of technology, everything that an individual human being could do has expanded manifold. In this enhanced state, and our numbers have increased tremendously. In the beginning of twentieth century, we were just about 1.5 billion people. Today, we are 7.3 billion people. The United Nations making predictions that by 2050, we will be 9.7 billion people. If all these people get educated, get technologically empowered, 9.7 billion people or nearly 10 billion people is for sure going to be a disaster. Yes. We can make arrangements and arrangements, we can improve the arrangements, we can make more energy saving machines, we can recycle the shit. Yes. We can do all this, but uh, if we don't come to our senses with human populations, there's going to be… I want you to just imagine how the world will be if the population almost goes up by fifty percent tomorrow. Just imagine your town, how it will be if fifty percent population increases tomorrow morning. Or in other words, no matter what we create, no matter how much we strive, whether whatever we build, everything is going to be insufficient because the planet is going to be insufficient. Of course, we are looking at planets which could sustain life outside of this solar system. We have found uh, two, three very promising planets uh, it's just a little, you know, not in the walking distance. A few, <laughs> few thousand or a million light years away. Great planets, I believe. But this is the thing. But nobody wants to address this issue. Everybody wants to talk about cosmetic solutions not address the basic problem of expanding human population. I was in a conference and uh, I said, see, unless you… <laughs> unless you reduce the human footprint on the planet, there is no solution for anything. Then they asked me a brilliant question, how do you reduce the human footprint? I said, you have to reduce the number of feet. That's the only way. <laughs> so, right now, 
It doesn't matter what others think, all of you who are here and those of you who are hanging out with me, we can take it upon ourselves that we will not push the human population. You can have a dog <laughs> she's there <laughs> A husband and wife were having a debate whether to have a child or not. The husband wanted a child, the wife hesitating because she will lose the shape of her body and you know. For a husband, having a baby is simple <laughs> but for the woman, it's too many things involved. So debate was going on and then they came and the debate moved into an area where should we have a baby or should we get a dog? Then they could not decide, they went to a counselor, they put their problem in front of him. So he said, you got to just make up your mind, whether you want to ruin the carpets or your life, I am not saying children are bad, they are wonderful, but it's just too many. So many that the insect population is going down. No, no, it's not a joke, it's very, it's very threatening. If the insect population disappears, the planet will be destroyed. Yes? The worms disappear, the planet will be destroyed. If you and me disappear, planet will flourish <laughs> So, leave the leaders alone because in every conference that you meet, very cosmetic solutions are being talked about. How to adjust the marketplace, okay? <laughs> how to do this, how to do that. Uh, on immediate scale, yes, those, those things are necessary, but you are talking about what is the future of this world. If that is so, if we want a future for this world, if we want our children and their children to live well on this planet, the only way is to bring down human population. Not by doing some horrible acts, but if we have, see, our life expectancy has improved. This means we have taken death into our hands. When we take death into our hands, it is our business to take birth also into our hands, isn't it? If we convince the population of this one thing, future is very bright because tomorrow morning the sun will come up, what's the problem? The next question comes from Sahil Gurung from the United Kingdom. Namaskaram. Tadguruji, my question is Is enlightenment a gradual process or it happens? when our body, mind and energies comes to a point where it is perfectly satisfied, like making a quantum leap. Thank you. Thank you. Are you asking how it happens uh, in UK or in India? <laughs> in planet Earth. <laughs> So the question is, uh, is enlightenment a gradual process of when your body, mind, energy is aligned, is it like a quantum leap? Is it something that bursts out? Yes. Yeah. 
<coughs> See, the mango season is just getting over. You don't know what it is, Sahil, you're in UK. Mango season is getting over in India, it's a big thing. If you look at the mango tree in the month of October, November, December, you didn't see any sweetness dripping out of it. Suddenly in January, February, flowers came. They were not as attractive as jasmine or rose flowers or something, some tiny little flowers came. Suppose you do not know this is a mango tree and you tested it, you take a leaf and bite it, it was quite bitter. But suddenly in the month of April, May, huge drops of sweetness hanging there in the tree. Sahil, you've not eaten the mango this season. I've got it from the supermarket. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're eating mangoes from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you did not have prayer, prayer knowledge that this is a mango tree, did you think this tree is actually manufacturing this sweetness? But you think suddenly in April sweetness came? It has been slowly manufacturing this sweetness and it put it out at a certain season, but it's been on right through the year, isn't it? Mangoes happen only in one season. You notice the sweetness only at a certain time. This does not mean the mango tree was not striving and working to produce that sweetness. You cut any part of the mango tree and taste it, you will not find <laughs> a slightest tinge of sweetness, believe me. But when the mango comes, how much sweetness? Where is it coming from? It's been working on it, you couldn't see it. Similarly, is it a process? For sure it's a process. But can everybody see the process, identify the process? No. When somebody is evolving on the spiritual path, others thought he's a nutcase, Somebody thought he's vagrant, somebody thought he's a vagabond, somebody thought he's something else. But when the sweetness came, everybody who tasted realized that this is a fantastic thing. So, nothing in the universe happens bang, bang, bang. Everything is a process. Can you identify the process? Can you recognize the process? Is the Generally, anybody who carries, generally among human beings, when they're children, any child which carries a certain level of genius within him, which is irrepressible, everybody has genius within them, but they're repressible. Systems in the society, their own fears, their own anxieties, their own need for security, represses their genius. Every human being has some kind of genius, but over ninety percent of the human beings never find expression to it because they give in to other things. Things become… other things become more important. When you were twelve, fifteen, you thought, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll go to the moon, but you saw the neighborhood girl, and started calling her the moon. <laughs> moon disappeared. <laughs> so, like this, in everybody, the possibility is open. The thing is, can and allow it to become that possibility. Between possibility and reality there is a distance. 
Most people neither have the courage nor the conviction to walk the distance. Largely spiritual process is a kind of an entertainment. Go to discourse after discourse, discourse after discourse, read more and more books and debate how your Atman, Karmatman, your soul is floating here, there and It's largely... <laughs> it's largely like entertainment. So, there is a process for sure. The process can be approached consciously or it may be an unconscious process, but you're doing the right things. This is the beauty of this universe. Whether you know or you do not know, knowingly or unknowingly, with discipline or with indiscipline, with love or with hate, if you do the right things, the right things will happen to you. That is the beauty of this universe. So Shankara, Adi Shankara said, yoga rotova, boga rotova. Somehow, either through yoga or boga, somehow do it. Somehow find the truth of your inner nature because what we are considering as truth is simply this. Whatever works on all levels of life must be the truth, isn't it? Hmm? Whatever really works on all levels of life must be the truth. Whatever you know in your life, test it right now because you have a mind which can project. Right now, you are striving for a certain level of income or a certain kind of house or a car or something else or something else. Put yourself in different stages of life and see if it still means a lot to you. See, suppose not tomorrow, let's say hundred years later, you're on your deathbed. Just see if your jewelry, your makeup, your car will mean something to you on that day. This does not mean you must give it up today. It is just that you must keep it in its place, you must not carry it in your heart. <laughs> there is a difference between using something and being used by something. Most people, most people do not know how to use the things that they buy. The things that they buy are using them up. They are enslaving the human being. Whatever things you want to use, you can use, that's not an issue. But the problem is, you let those things use you, this is not okay. So if you just take care that you are not used by anything. You understand the limited role that everything has in your life, the limited role of your education, the limited role of your career, the limited role of your marriage, the limited role of your relationships, the limited role of your wealth, the limited role of everything that you're doing. If you understand where one thing begins and where it ends, then you don't have to do anything. When the season is ripe, the flowers will bloom and mangoes will come. <laughs> the next question <laughs> comes from a prominent figure in Indian public life. This is the Honorable Minister of State for Culture, Tourism and Civil Aviation. Dr. Mahesh Sharma. Thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, you gave me the opportunity to have this uh, celebration of Guru Purnimotsa with this much big presence over here. But a big question comes to my mind that we keep, and especially the Indians keep, after the God and the parents, Guru at the highest esteem but we have not been able to make Guru Purnima celebration itself in the same spirit of high spirit as we respect the Gurus. 
Uh, I kind of addressed this already in the beginning, but anyway, the reason why Guru Purnima and so many other things which were of great spiritual importance in this country have slid back into the background of our lives is because we have been an occupied nation for a period of time and whatever the framework that the occupying forces set for us, when we got our independence, we should have looked at what kind of framework we want for our nation. We did not do that. We just allowed the same framework to continue. For example, in this country, right from ancient times, even for a farmer who plows the land, even today many farmers don't set their plow on their land on Monday mornings. Yes? In Tamil Nadu it's still true. In the north it's been given up because no, no animals being used, all tractors, you have to, you have taken a bank loan, the interest is ticking, so you want it to run all the seven days, <laughs> all these things. When the British came, they changed these things because they, they knew the strength of this nation was essentially in the culture. So they wanted to break the culture, very systematically they engineered how to break the culture. They made you Sunday holiday, what are you going to do on Sunday? Watch television and eat potato chips? What are you going to do on Sunday? They had an intention for a Sunday morning. What is the intention for the majority of the population in this country on Sunday? There's nothing for us to do on Sunday morning. Monday morning there are lots of things happening, but you have to go to office. For a long time in this country, the monthly holidays were like this. Purnami means, every Purnami means three days holiday, one day before, the day and the next day. Amavasya means two days holiday. These, these two days of full moon day and new moon day have something to do with our system, something to do with the planet, something to do with the very way we are born. We are physically here today only because our mother's bodies were in sync with the cycles of the moon, otherwise we won't be here. So there are things which are happening in your system as you know, the very oceans are rising on these days. When such a massive body of water is rising up, this body, which is over seventy percent water, you rising in this, that though those days were significant days, those are not the days to go to work, those are the, the days to focus upon yourself. So, similarly the Guru Purnima used to be a huge festival across the, this whole region, but it's gone because people have to go to work. So I request you, being a, you being a minister in the union cabinet, this is something that you must do. <laughs> that I know for you to pitch for every Pavanami uh, being a holiday is not going to be practical, but at least Guru Purnima. <laughs> if you, from the federal government, from the central government, if you declare Guru, Guru Purnima as a holiday, I will make sure Guru Purnima is celebrated across this country with great fervor. <laughs> Because, because the spirit is still alive, there is no space for expression. There is no space or time for expression. Please, if you can do this one thing and we can make Guru Purnima a big attra tourism attraction for this in country, <laughs> as, 
as I've already spoken to you about making spirit, India the spiritual gateway, Guru Purnima can be the day which really draws spiritual tourists from across the world to this country. So even as a part of your job, it's a good thing to do. Sadhguru, the next question comes from Hina Parikh, a 20-year-old student from Northampton in the United Kingdom. Um, Sadhguru, what is the significance of initiation? Okay. What is the significance of initiation? <clears throat> initiation is not about a bundle of instructions. In fact, in any initiation process, instructions are a kind of disturbance. It's a nuisance. I'm saying it's a nuisance because we're still giving instructions because most people because today they've all become educated. Everything has to be told, you know, or it must be printed <laughs> these days. If you tell them also, it's not enough. They wanted a printed sheet, the instructions of the initiation, because uh, they're all educated. Their brains are full of words, not of life. Too many words. So everything has to be verbal, even saying it is not good enough, you have to print it or you have to record it and give it to them so that they can put headphones and listen to the instructions every time. Initiation is not a bundle of words. If we have to use an analogy, if you know something about electricity, in electrical employer, you know, uh, motors and stuff, there is something called as induction. The power is there, the motor is there, everything is there, but without an induction switch, it will not go. All the ingredients are there, but still it will not happen because there's no induction of energy. So initiation is like an induction. You have all the ingredients to be meditative, but it doesn't happen. Why does it not happen? Because this is the way the creation itself happened. If you go by the traditional explanation, one way, if you go by the modern scientific way, it's the same thing said in a different language. Modern science is talking about how everything was empty space. Now they're removing the word empty and saying it was space. There is no physicality there, but there seems to be something else there. What that something else, we don't know, as for the science. And today they've made experiments where in vacuum state, if you apply a certain energy around it, not into it, around it, suddenly virtual protons and virtual neutrons will spill out. That means creation begins just because there's energy playing around. There's a beautiful story in the yogic tradition, Shiva. You must understand the word Shiva. Shiva means Shiva means that which is not. Now appropriate description for space. That which is, is physical creation. That which is not, is non-physical dimension of the existence. So Shiva means that which is not. Shiva was lying, his body spread across the cosmos, but he's not. He doesn't exist. He doesn't have a physical manifestation. Then Shakti, a certain dimension of energy, came and danced around him. And then he came alive. Then he started spitting galaxies out of his mouth. This is the most appropriate description of how creation happened. 
still splitting galaxies, new galaxies, it's continuously happening. Simply because a certain energy touched it. Everything that was needed for creation was already there in him, but he needed induction. So initiation is a kind of an induction process, but unfortunately today, if I just ask people to just sit here, we'll do things for you, then will <laughs> Nothing happening, why is he not doing anything? You're supposed to say something. So what to do? For modern times we say a lot of things, we hang out with you. <laughs> Today if you go and sit in the Dhyanalinga temple, without instruction you can become meditative. I can't do that to you here now. What's her name, this girl? Tina? Tina, you're in UK. If you're willing to just sit there, I can do it to you now, wherever you are. But right now, you got two, you're a student, still educating. Maybe you're a possibility, not fully educated. Too many words in your head. The only thing you understand is words. Because of that, instructions have come. Otherwise, initiation is not about instruction. There are really no instruction in it. Initiation is just an induction process. It's an energy process. But we have to talk about energy, you know. We have to talk a lot about energy before they open their mouth and, oh, appuriya. Tough times for gurus, too much talking. <laughs> if you don't talk, nobody will be here. Very few can really understand if you simply sit here and reverberate, they will also sit here and reverberate. Those numbers are small. Well, in Isha those numbers are increasing. I don't have to say much. <laughs> but in the larger world, you have to, you have to talk, talk, talk and talk, hang out with people. Global gossip. Our next online participant is Manj Music, a well-known Punjabi hip-hop singer. And he prefers to call his input an offering rather than a question. Oh, the audio works. Namaste, I'm very happy that you have been here for the last few days and have been here for the last few days and have been here for the last few days. I don't want to say anything, but for the Guru, I want to do two lines. Oh, you have been here for the last few days, you have been here for the last few days, O tiri aada vich viriya, din raat ni din aya ve. The next question comes from Samir Oberoi, an advertising professional in Gurgaon. And his question, Sadhguru, is, I hope to visit the ashram for Mahashivaratri next year because I've been inspired by your description of Shiva as the ultimate outlaw. Can you tell us something more about this fascinating figure? Uh, Shiva being the ultimate outlaw, you must understand what is outlaw. Many of you have suffered in-laws <laughs> I hope you won't meet too many outlaws. But when we say the ultimate outlaw, you must understand all loss, all loss, 
are of some meaning only in the physical sphere of life. See, suppose you did not have a body. I want you to just imagine yourself. You don't have a body. What law do you have to follow? <laughs> you can go wherever you want, you can do whatever you want, yes? Only because you have a body, where to go, where not to go, what to do, what not to do. Only in the physical realm, the laws have a meaning. One who has transcended the physical, he has no loss, so he's outlaw. He's out of all loss. This is what spiritual process means. Within yourself, you are out of all loss because once you transcend your physical nature, none of the loss bind you. In the society, yes, but within yourself, no, because you're an outlaw because you're out of the physical nature. So in that context, he is the ultimate outlaw. And Mahashivratri is his day. The significance of the day is that on that day, there is a phenomenal upsurge of the system. This is why on that night you are not supposed to sleep, you must keep your spine vertical so that you make use of this natural upsurge within you. So on that night there is a huge festival here. This year, this is going to be a mega festival because we have crossed the twenty-one year cycle. This is a new cycle. And it is going to be a phenomenal event. You must… Uh, you're in Gurgaon, not too far away. You must be here on that day. It's an incredible night and uh, we'll have many things happening on that night. We are already… our teams are working. This is your major possibility for every human being. And we will also make it happen across the country and in many parts of the world, in various cities, having video feeds and stuff, though there is a time difference in the other countries. And as a precursor to this in a way, not really a precursor but this is a special event which happens only once, only once, that is we don't repeat this. This events like this where their production quality, entire ashram is done up for this purpose, not like other programs which are repeated, this is only one time programs. We did Vaibhav Shiva, which was about how Shiva taught yoga. Then we did three years later Leela. This is about how Krishna taught yoga. Then about three years ago we did Mahabharat, which is the grandest story that you can imagine. It's a story inside a story inside a story. It is the most phenomenal story, it's the longest story on the planet. So an eight-day event happened like this, hundreds of hours of videos, they're still editing, not released after three years. <laughs> so this year, in the month of December, between 22nd and 26th, we will have an event which is about the devotees of Shiva. We have not… There are different types of cultures which have evolved out of devotion for Shiva. They are in different geographical locations in the country largely and they have their own practices, they have their own traditions, cultures, their own flavor, their own poetry, their own music. So this will be… Uh, an exquisite event of music, art, poetry and of course the spiritual fundamental. So this will be about the devotees of Shiva. This will be a limited number of people, we can't have a crowd like this. <laughs> but others uh, can hang out later, <laughs> okay? We'll make it available to you in some way. So this will be a four, five day event in the month of December, start, starting on the winter solstice, which is 22nd of December.
21st of December. Uh, it's an event to look forward to because it's a one-time event. We will not repeat those events again. Those of you who can afford to be there in terms of time and whatever else, please make sure you're there. Uh, I'm excited. <laughs> and the last question at this evening's satsang comes from Carmen Dragomir, a journalist and writer from Romania. She's not a gymnast, huh? <laughs> Namaskaram, Sadhguru. On the occasion of Guru Purnima, what is the best gift a seeker can give to his Guru? Can we actually give anything to our Guru? Or unlike other relationships, is just a take and take for a student? Uh, on the occasion of Guru Purnima, what is the best gift a seeker can give to his or her guru? Can we actually give anything to our guru? Or unlike other relationships, it's just a take and take relationship for a student. Now, if you really take and take, I would be eternally grateful to you. The problem is you take and throw, take and throw, take and throw. <laughs> if you simply take, take and take, what more does the guru want? <laughs> and about a gift that you can give me, I appreciate the emotion behind it. I truly appreciate the emotion behind it. But I want you to understand this much. A gift means something that you can give away. If you can give it away, why would I need it? <laughs> if you can give it away, obviously I don't need it. But you can, in the name of Guru, you can give it away to a child who needs it. You can, in the name of Guru, you can give it away to some, some other uh, project or process or something that's happening, that's up to you. Now, what one needs to understand is, if you're really serious about offering a gift to your guru, what you're saying in a little… Uh, with a certain… what to say, with a certain… Uh, disturbance within you, is this just about take and take? Please just take and take, not take and throw, okay? If you take, take, take and take, that's the greatest thing you can do for me <laughs> you. Now, on this Guru Purnima, In some way, if you want to really make a gift, in some way, you offer something that is you, not some material that you can get rid of. Give away the nastiest part of you today, to me, okay? I am not asking for the beautiful things that are there in you. I am not even asking for your love. I am asking whatever is the nastiest part of you, your prejudice, your hatred, your anger, give it away to me today, let me see. Because I want you to know if you give away your anger to me, I know how anger is tremendous energy, you know. I know how to transform anger into something very fantastic. 
So, if not the whole of you, at least one nasty part of you, please give it away today, let me see. Hmm? Can you? The beautiful things you can keep for yourself, the nastiest part of you, please give it away to me, let me see. Don't give me your mother-in-law. <laughs> Sadhguru, please take. <laughs> something that's a part of you. If you think you want to give something, because I'm telling you, because many questions were asked in this direction, the greatest thing, or the most important thing that needs to happen on this planet is an inward moment within human beings. This hugely empowered humanity without the necessary inner balance is a potential danger to everybody. To everything, to every other life, to every other creature we are a danger. So more and more people should commit themselves to turn the world inward. If you are already deeply entangled in life, at least send your children in the direction. Something that is very precious to you, that's what you must give, isn't it, if you want to give? Send your children in the direction that they will strive to turn the world inward because this is the most important thing that needs to happen if human beings and every other creature on this planet has to live reasonably well on this planet. Otherwise there is no other way. So, if you want to give something nasty, please give it away, I'm welcome, you're most welcome. If you want to give you must give yourself, your time, your life. If that's not possible, anyway, the future generation at least turn them in that direction, it's very important. This is for the well-being of their future. It's very, very important that big number of people turn inward and they have a sense of balance. If this doesn't you will see a very bad human society, which will rub and clash the friction that happens is too much. So, on this day, on this very auspicious day, my best wishes and blessings for you to live as glorious human beings. Thank you very much for hanging out with us. Namaste. Before signing off, we'd like to extend a very special invitation to you. On the 23rd and 24th of September 2015, Sadhguru will consecrate a powerful sacred space at the Isha Institute of Inner Sciences in Tennessee, USA. Adi Yogi, the abode of yoga, will be a magnificent 30,000 square foot structure dedicated to the pursuit of yoga. It is a tribute to the great being who transmitted the living science of yoga to humanity many thousands of years ago. We leave you with a mosaic of glimpses of previous very powerful consecrations conducted by Satguru at the Isha Yoga Center in Coimbatore, South India. Before signing off, we'd like to extend a very special invitation to you. On the 23rd and 24th of September 2015, Sadhguru will consecrate a powerful sacred space at the Isha Institute of Inner Sciences in Tennessee, USA. Adi Yogi, the abode of yoga, will be a magnificent 30,000 square foot structure dedicated to the pursuit of yoga. It is a tribute to the great being who transmitted the living science of yoga to humanity. You are uh, not going to witness the consecration, you are going to participate in the consecration process. So it's a different level of responsibility, it's a different level of focus, it's a different level of existence altogether. Just be there, absolutely. We need the cooperation from you. All the
are willing, they should not miss this possibility and this privilege of being able to manifest the divine. चलाया इंद्रधनुष ने धरती पर रंग छलका लाल पीला हरा 